You know what my favorite part about games is? It's the moments. The moments of stillness, of pain, and of hope. Those moments that will last with us forever. So today, let's take a look at the most powerful moments this medium has ever had to offer, at least for me, and see what it is that makes this medium so damn special. Dumb. I've talked a lot on this channel about why I personally think Cyberpunk 2077 is the most memorable game I've ever played. And it's not because of the controversy, the hate, or the bugs and glitches on launch. It's because the game tells the most important story in our lives, about choosing love over excess, the quiet life over a name etched into eternity, and teaches us the lessons we all should learn lest we forge a path of nothing but a blaze of glory in our wake. And all of this game's lessons come down to one moment right at the end, the moment I fell in love with this story, and for those of you who always ask, the reason this is my favorite game of all time. Because you see, in Cyberpunk, there are a bunch of different endings that are so powerful. In one, we get to leave the city behind with the person we love most, but only a couple of months to live. In another, we can give up our body entirely to a man who failed to use his in any meaningful way in a past life, giving him one last shot at redemption. And in one specific ending, we even find ourselves trapped on a space station as our mind evolves into horror and madness. Each and every one of these stories is so powerful because they are in service of the greater goal of this game, the goal that makes it my favorite of all time, of showing that while many of us chase the fast life, the blaze of glory or money and fame, the only thing that can bring us real salvation in the end is each other. Holding those we love close and not letting go. Helping those around us in pain. And no matter what, not giving up our humanity and kindness for something the world tells us we ought to have. By choosing the quiet life over the blaze of glory, we get the endings of pure togetherness and meaning. And by choosing our own self-validation over others, we get the endings of utter sadness and despair. But there's one ending to this game that's more powerful than all of that. The one ending. The one moment that truly shows us the message behind this game and why it matters. When you go to Misty's and take the long elevator ride up to the roof where you get to meet Johnny and decide the path you will take at the final mission of the game, most players choose one of the ones I already listed. But one of the other options seldom picked is to forgo all of that and instead take the pills you were given right at the start of Act 2 and throw your life away because none of it matters. Throughout the entire game you have been going on quest after quest journey after journey deeper into a city that just doesn't give a shit. A city that doesn't care about you, about happiness, or about anybody. There are people being tortured and kidnapped, gangs promoting violence everywhere you go, and people who backstab you at every turn. And throughout it all, this beautiful yet dark city shows you over and over again that none of it matters. That no matter what you do, the world will be filled with pain and suffering, the likes of which you never can escape from. So maybe the best option is to just give up, to take your gun, point it inwards, and take that shot, only for the final scene of the game to show the city drowning out the sounds of the bullet as it ignites in the barrel, revealing that you were right, no one cared, and another life gone means nothing in a world born of such tragedy. But then, the most important moment in any game I've ever played dips into frame. The credits begin, and beside them, little video logs of the people you grew to know and love throughout the game talking about your passing. From Victor, we see denial that a person he called a friend could leave him like this. From Pan Am, we see absolute disgust and anger at the cowardice of our actions and the people we have hurt because of our own selfish sense of superiority. From Misty, we see sorrow, acceptance, and understanding of our anguish and actions. After all, the world is a dark place, isn't it? But the most compelling of them all is from Judy. Crying and stumbling on her words, we can see the pain in her eyes and feel the weakness in her voice. Still, Z. Did you even think about, you know, what happens when... I... Shit, I can't do this. Earlier in the game, she had lost her closest friend to the same fate 
and in her state of vulnerability she found solace in us in the friendship and love we provided in her darkest times and if you take your life at the end of cyberpunk 2077 you have to sit and watch as she cries and screams in pain because the only person she had left in her whole life decided they were too scared of the world and left her to deal with it this moment is more powerful than any big cutscene, action sequence, or explosion could ever be. Seeing the effect you can have on those around you and those you love. Seeing that despite how hard life can be, how evil the world can feel, or how pointless the future can seem, that despite all of that, there are those in the world who care about you, those who need you, and more than anything, a universe that you owe a life of love and understanding, if at least for those who will suffer in the future less because of the courage you had to stay and fight. Because behind every backstreet filled with pain in this game, there's a quiet moment where you get to see that even in a world full of evil, there is always hope. There is always a Judy, someone, or something, a world that's counting on you. That's why this ending to Cyberpunk 2077, and really all of the other endings as well, are some of the most memorable moments in a game ever. And for any of you who are curious and always ask in the comments section, that's why Cyberpunk is my favorite game of all time. Because it reaches to places and has moments that many of the other great games of history could only dream of. And despite all of its many flaws, leaves us with the most important lessons that we can ever learn in our lives. That despite all of the pain and the suffering, it's all worth it in the end because of the goodness in the hearts and souls of the people around us. That, that's what we should be fighting for. Nier Automata is one of the most impressive games of the last decade, and that's because it has a moment that transcends the medium itself and implants itself into our minds and souls alike. A moment so powerful and so memorable that many who have played say it is the greatest ending to a game of all time. You see, in Nier Automata, the game takes place in a world built around the ideas of love, sacrifice, and free will. Throughout the game, you slowly unravel the mysteries of an Earth that's been attacked by an ancient alien machine army, and how humanity had to build massive armies of androids to fight back on Earth, all while they escape to the moon. But the story quickly becomes one about lies, deception, and the existence of an entire race of beings that have now all lost their meaning and hope. In the game, you play as 2B, 9S, and A2, all androids that were originally made by human beings in the fight to preserve the human race against the alien machines, but now in game they are slowly starting to realize that their sole reason for creation is gone. Humanity has disappeared, and with it, the meaning for this entire war going on. But it's a secret being kept from both the androids and the machines alike in order to make them fight a never-ending war and give them a purpose where there is none. So in game, you must go on a journey to discover what it even means to have a purpose in a world where you've lost yours. And along the way, you get to meet different machine tribes with different ideas, all while the game gives you little direction an analogy to finding your own free will. There are actually over 20 different endings as well, but in terms of actually meaningful ones that aren't jokes or one-offs, there's just five. And this means you have to play through the game multiple times as different characters from different perspectives to get the full picture. And it's on that fifth ending to the game, the final one, ending E, that a moment you can never forget occurs. After all the characters have died and moved on, you get a prompt from the androids companion pods you played as that holds the consciousness to these beings, and should you choose, you can let them survive and live on. If you do, suddenly you are met with a new game mode where you have to fight the final boss, a shooting gallery of every developer and person who has worked on the game represented as little red dots as they try to attack your pod and kill you. So over and over again, you try and try to best the final battle, but are met with utter defeat again and again. Suddenly words of encouragement start to pop up on screen and give you hope that you can finish this battle. Messages that strangely are not from NPCs in game, but other players in our real world. So you continue to fight on and still cannot best this perplexing final encounter. That is until a final prompt after failing non-stop shows up on screen, where you are asked if you will accept help from others. And if you do, an army of drones fills the screen and an armada and flurry of bullets rains on the red dots that before were unstoppable. The music starts to roar and the messages of kindness and help take over the screen from other players that have come to support you. And just like that, you best the final boss of the game. 
the credits of each person who worked so hard on it, and you are met with one final decision, one of the most memorable moments in a game ever. You are told that you can choose to help someone else in the future on their journey just like others came to help you, but that in order to do so, you must make the ultimate sacrifice. By deleting all of your save data, all of the collectibles you garnered on your playthrough, and all hope of going back to those side quests you missed, by giving up all of the hard work and countless hours you put into this beautiful game and throwing it all away, you can help someone else out there. Someone that needs more people to come to their rescue in order to finally beat the game. Only by giving up everything do you get the real ending to Nier Automata, and the best moment in the entire game. Realizing that in a world where all hope is lost, and all meaning has been stripped away, we can again find solace by helping those around us, and sacrificing our own hubris and ego for the lives and happiness of others. It's a moment beyond just helping characters in a game, but rather helping others in our own world that we barely even know. Finding meaning in a world that previously had none, and creating a moment that will last with us well beyond the credits and save games we have lost. A moment that shows why games are the best form of art out there. I've played a lot of games in my life that have interesting twists or story moments that turn everything on its head in ways you least expect. But the only twist in a game that has ever actually left me speechless is the infamous end of Act 1 of Inscription, a smaller indie game that still to this day a lot of people don't know about. You see, Inscription starts as nothing more than a creepy card game. Something seems off the start even in the menu screen trying to begin the game, but once you get into the thick of things, Inscription at its core is a very competent and fun card game with a lot of creepy and haunting aesthetics. You are trapped in a cabin in the woods and must try to find a way out, but in order to do so, you must play a card game against a mysterious dark figure in the cabin with you. Between each session, you can stand up from the desk, walk around, and explore this strange wooden structure. And through these adventures, you can unlock new cards and powers that can help you more easily take down all of the different bosses in the card game in order to reach the final ending stage. This first part of the game is often the longest, and as you slowly become stronger and stronger and gain more and more knowledge of the cards through each failed attempt to survive through all bosses on one run, you are also unraveling the mystery of exactly what's going on here. The cards themselves speak out to you and scream in pain. There are demonic symbols and sounds all over the cabin. Eyes track you wherever you go, watching your every move. And the more you play it, the more it becomes clear that there is something a lot deeper to this game and its story than just one of my favorite card games of all time. And that's because when you finally do beat all bosses on one run, including the final one, Leshy, the man who you are stuck in the cabin with, you are treated to one of the most memorable moments a game has ever had, and also my favorite twist in a game of all time. After defeating Leshy, you slowly walk your way towards a door of piercing light in the distance, and when you finally gaze through its golden arches, you are met with an entirely new screen. A look at a roll of film hidden inside a cuckoo clock puzzle you had to solve in the cabin earlier in game. And on this roll of film are several different found footage videos featuring a man named Luke Carter. Luke is making content for his YouTube channel, and one of his recent videos is about a vintage card game called Inscription. He found at a strange yard sale in town, and after opening it, he finds a mysterious set of coordinates to a location nearby him. So through these found footage tapes, we slowly descend into madness as we follow Luke on his journey to uncovering these sets of cards for a game that no one knows about. And it devolves into Luke starting to lose his mind, strange things happening on camera, and even eventually FBI and other mysterious figures showing up at the house, until a final harrowing scene to the game I won't spoil. But on top of this, the twist in the game is a lot more than just a cool and creepy set of found footage tapes, because after sifting through just a couple of them, you are thrust into Act 2 and 3 of the game. And here you actually get to play the game of Inscription itself, on a corrupt floppy disk that Luke found in some of the tapes you watch, where you get to play in a 16-bit world that looks and plays completely differently to the first act. But with the same core card game, this time though with tons of new choices and mechanics that greatly expand on the system that was already awesome in the first act. Not only is this twist, this moment in Inscription so memorable for the narrative and absolutely perfect ambiance it captures, but realizing that 
you weren't even playing the real game this entire time is mind-bending. It literally feels like once you start Act 2, you're playing an entirely new game from a new studio, with only a mild resemblance based on some of the cards and characters you met. It's such a powerful moment too because in my personal opinion, it's always great when a game can keep throwing things at you that you don't expect. And finding out that you're trapped inside a meta-narrative about a man descending into madness makes everything much more interesting. I've played other games that constantly keep you on your toes, like my personal favorite co-op game of all time, It Takes Two, but no other game has had moments quite as profound as Inscription. One where even years later, I have thought back to that first playthrough I had and how much of a surprise the twist was. Many times nowadays, it's hard to stand out amongst the crowd and be unique when there have been so many stories told. But in this sea of games, Inscription is one of the best new and fascinating stories with a stellar twist in recent memory. And because of that, for me at least, it's one of the most memorable game moments of all time. Mass Effect is one of the most important video game series of all time. And it's a shame because we haven't seen a new one in over six years, or a great one in over a decade. Once the crowning achievement of sci-fi across an entire industry now only sits as a memory of a bygone era. And while my relentlessly optimistic mind is hopeful that the newest installment coming will be great, we'll have to wait and find out if it can match the awe of what came before. Because the original trilogy of Mass Effect was a series all about the moments. Moments like the first time you flew into the Citadel and walked around its massive and retro-futuristic hallways all the way into the seedy underbelly. Like when we first uncovered the Thorian or the Rachni and all the mysteries of these ancient beings. Talking to Sovereign on Vermeer in the greatest video game speech of all time, and a haunting one at that. Standing side by side with our companions in the final mission of the second game, or watching the payoffs of everything we did come to full fruition in the third. But maybe the most powerful moment of all, the moment that has etched itself into my mind forever, is the ending of one Morden Solus. A Solarian scientist that was part of STG, or the Solarian Special Task Group, that was doing research into the Krogan Genophage, a disease released by the Solarians many years ago that made the Krogan's population of fearsome and brutish warriors infertile, so that they could not continue multiplying and threatening the galaxy anymore. The Krogans, while violent, were still an intelligent species that had helped fight off the Rachni, and so over the past couple of decades, they've had to watch as almost all of their species slowly died away and withered with no hope. Yet in the recent years that you play the game, some Krogans started to show signs of resistance, proving that there still may be hope for an entire species. But Morden, who you recruit into your team in the second game, clearly tells you that his goal is to stop this from happening, to release an updated strain of the Genophage and silence the Krogans' hope once and for all. So it's in this third game, in one of the best missions in the entire series, that you finally get to decide the fate of an entire race of alien creatures. For some of you psychopaths, you may have convinced Morden to continue the genophage and save the galaxy from a race that was honestly quite dangerous in some ways. But for most of us, after seeing the heart and soul of the Krogan over multiple games, we chose to convince Morden to stop his plans, and instead release a cure in the Shroud of Tuchanka, a massive spire in the center of the homeworld of the Krogan that would cure all of them of their deadly affliction. And if you choose this path, then in Morden's final moments, we get to see him climb the tower during an all-out assault, certain of his death. So as the tower is crumbling and shaking in its last breaths, Morden arrives at the center console and initiates the dispersal of the cure to the genophage that he has developed, all while he hums his favorite song and looks out into the sky of a world he has saved right before his death. The very man who dedicated himself to the destruction of an entire species, in the end decides to turn his back on the horrors he has wrought and instead use his skills of intellect and knowledge to become the hero that he was inside all along. Forgoing all of his hatred, pain, and disgust, to instead live out his final moments to the duty and honor of an entire species that didn't deserve utter annihilation. It's a fantastic end to the arc of one of my favorite characters 
characters in the whole series, and shows just how deep and emotional the original trilogy can get. And while most people seem to like the second game for its characters, for me, the third is infinitely better because of the moments like this, where you get to sit side by side with characters you have spent likely hundreds of hours with, and watch as they take the ultimate sacrifice to save a galaxy teetering on the edge of destruction. Looking out across a world and knowing that while many may not live to see another day, through the actions and the journey you have been on, many others will. This moment here with Morden is the perfect example of what makes Mass Effect so great, and for me is the moment I'll never forget, along with so many others in this legendary series. Hi-Fi Rush shouldn't be the type of game I love. I'm not into platformers, I don't like the anime style of art, and the world on its surface seems too childlike and whimsical for my taste. But when you actually take the time to play and experience this game, you realize that at its core it has so much heart, and especially towards the end, so many amazing moments that just feel awesome. Many of the action sequences and songs in the later half are nothing but pure joy, and there are times in the game where I quite literally was on the edge of my seat because of how great the storytelling and action action brawler battle arenas set to famous and fast paced scores were. However, maybe the best moments in this game are also the ones that were the most unexpected. Those moments that took a break from all the fast paced action and instead focused on the characters and their emotional journey, how they were feeling in the moment. And the single best example of this in game comes in one of the final chapters, track 11, where we get to infiltrate the main antagonist Kale's office and come face to face with the man we have been chasing down the whole game. In this first encounter though, he bests us by putting a massive harmonic field around us that destroys our only weapon, our guitar, dooming us to have no shot of getting out and saving the day. The team has lost hope and realized that even after coming this far, it was all for nothing. But that's when Chai, the main character we play as, realizes that maybe the power he had never was in the guitar, but rather was inside himself all along. The hope the dream, and the optimism to realize that the true ability they always held as a team was the belief that they could all do it, and the friendships they made along the way. And while that's about as cheesy an anime moment as you can have, it works out so damn well here. So Chai puts his hand against the barrier, and the best song in the entire game kicks in as you hear and remember the best moments from these amazing characters past. The tempo builds, and an almost Guitar Hero-like sequence of button smashing starts to play out. It's the perfect example of what makes this game so good. Combining music into every moment to entirely capture that feeling in our hearts and souls to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It's the moment in the game where you realize it's a lot more than just another fun hero's journey with exhilarating combat and sick animation and presentation. It's a game all about those moments about crafting a sequence of events that lasts with you forever. And after breaking free from this cage and realizing the power you all held within yourselves all along, you and your friends jump down into maybe one of the most fun battle sequences in a game, where another amazing song starts to roar in the background as you play. And during all of this, you all come together as a team and on the fly start to tear apart an entire arena as you make your way to the biggest boss fight in the entire game. I love when games give you that deeper emotional feeling that really speaks to your soul. Because that, that's what makes games so special. Those moments we think back to that evoke such powerful feelings in all of us. Those moments of coming together, of reaching our peak, where our hearts are racing a mile a minute because of how amazing what we're seeing on screen is. I know a lot of you probably haven't ever given this game a shot. It's not one I talk about a whole lot on this channel. But God is it one of the best I have played. And even though I forget about it sometimes too because it's a smaller game from a studio not yet beloved, and a style that being animation I'm seldom into, thinking about the best moments I've ever had in games, well Hi-Fi Rush without a doubt is full of them. And this moment in Track 11 specifically is the shining example of the deeper joy this game can bring you if you give it a shot. Fallout is a series that's great for a lot of reasons, first and foremost being the world and the stories that are told inside it. But within any great world, and especially the Bethesda kind, there are moments that stick with us forever, like igniting the nuke at Megaton, meeting the master in the original Fallout, or finding the Institute in Fallout 4. 
For me though, the moment that stands above all is the type of thing Bethesda are most known for, one of their staples. The moment when you first emerge into one of their worlds, after being held back like a butterfly in a cocoon. In Skyrim, we had to deal with a meme, in Morrowind, a boat, and an oblivion sewer rats. But Fallout, Fallout is all about the vaults, and these give us the perfect setting to go forth into a new world and explore. But no game handled this beginning sequence better than Fallout 3. And that's because in Fallout 3, you start your journey deep within the depths of Vault 101. It's a place you're born into from the very first breaths you take as a baby, and through your entire journey into becoming an adult, you get to live out the fantasy of surviving in this vault, making friends, fighting bullies, and just trying to understand what it would really be like to be trapped in a place like this forever. You get to see elders come and go, relationships form, and disputes be fought over. But then many years later, on one fateful day, your father goes missing and other men are looking for you probably to cause harm. So you are forced to fight your way out past the confines of the only thing you have ever known. Embrace yourself for not only leaving behind all of those you grew up with, but also the road ahead into a world that you have been told is an utter catastrophe. Finally reaching the end of this intro sequence and getting to turn the vault doors open for the first time is one of the most memorable moments in a Bethesda game ever. As you fumble your way past the Vault 101 door, you see the outside for the first time and the light blinds you from its touch, slowly revealing to you your worst fears. A completely barren and desolate wasteland. One full of gray, decay, and hopelessness, but also one with a mysterious beauty to it all. Off in the distance, you can see ruins of what used to be buildings, and also potentially the makeshift construction of a new civilization on the horizon. It's a surreal moment, getting to finally see this outside world that has been hyped up in-game for almost an hour just in the intro alone, and realizing that your journey is only just about to get started. To me, it's the perfect example of what a Bethesda intro should be. It's about setting your expectations for one thing and then shattering them, revealing to the player that everything you are about to experience is so much more than you thought. And more than anything, putting us into the exact mindset the character would be in if they actually existed in this world. The wonderment and bewilderment of discovering a whole new world out there and coming to terms with the fact that everything is about to change. And while subsequent playthroughs of Fallout 3 can feel slow at first having to go through the intro sequence again for something you've already seen, I think having that amazing buildup at the behest of replayability sometimes is key to building a moment that can last with us forever. And for that reason, this is the Bethesda intro that lasted with me the most. 2008 was a different time. It was the year we saw the release of many classics like Left 4 Dead, Dead Space, Grand Theft Auto 4, and Fallout 3. But for me, that year was memorable for a different reason. Because 2008 was the year I tried out my first MMO as a kid, World of Warcraft, and there couldn't have been a better time to jump in. To this day, the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic to me is the height of Blizzard Entertainment and their now storied history. And I'll never forget how it made me feel. It was when the studio was firing on all cylinders and it seemed like they could do no wrong, building upon years of unrivaled legacy. World of Warcraft was about to grow into the biggest heights its player base had ever seen, and to cap it all off, this cinematic trailer played at BlizzCon to solidify that we really just were in a special time. Watching Arthas command the Legion of Undead at his side and hearing the roar of the music was about the most exciting thing in gaming that year. And more than that, it really was just a memorable moment in time and proof that everyone was playing something really special. I vividly remember stepping out into the world as a blood elf named Dranix on my first character, and being in awe at the vastness of the world. There were so many people running around, trading, talking, and making guilds for anything you could think about. There were giant monsters to slay, epic quests to go on, and at the end of it all was the promise of the best raid the game had seen yet, fighting the most recognizable protagonist in the series, Arthas the Lich King. It really was just a culmination of all the years of love and care that had been put into the game up to that point. And to this day, I haven't had a game quite capture the feeling WoW first gave me as a kid, trying it out for the first time in its third expansion on release 
Feliz Day. Getting truly lost in a new world and making friends along the way, discovering new locations with so much backstory and intrigue, and falling in love with the characters and hype behind them. There are people who even now, decades later, can recall every moment they had during this time and all the new friends they made and experiences they went on because it was such a strong and vibrant community at the time. It's funny too because to be honest, I can look back on those days and know the game was never that good. The combat has always always mostly sucked and was extremely easy in many of the older raids. It's always sort of been a waste of time, and the story and quests were never top tier. But WoW really did capture one of the most memorable gaming moments in history. When the industry was in a more infantile stage without microtransactions and endless controversy like we see in newer titles like Diablo 4 and Overwatch. It was slower, more about creating lasting friendships, and just having fun in a world that wasn't the one we know in our own lives lives today, but instead one that was more magical and fantastical. Sometimes the best moments in games aren't any one thing, any one emotional beat or story twist, but rather a section in time that a game managed to capture perfectly, that is a harken back to what made life so great in those moments. So while this isn't a moment you can ever experience again for yourself if you missed it, it's maybe one of the most interesting because of how it came and went, and is a perfect example of why we should always cherish the moments we have, the place and time we're at now, because you never know when it'll all go away and never be able to return again. And that's just part of growing up, isn't it? But maybe a new game, a new MMO one day based on entirely new principles could breathe life into the genre, so we'll just have to wait and see. For now though, few worlds out there have had any moments as memorable as the heights of World of Warcraft and Wrath of the Lich King and the friends and people and experiences that will last with us forever. Sometimes, sometimes not everything is as it seems. And no other game gave us a more memorable moment like this than the original Bioshock from Ken Levine and team. Bioshock is a series all about exploring our minds and taking us on journeys to fantastical places with amazing lore, characters, and scenes. And while for me personally, I prefer Prey, the greatest immersive sim and most underrated game of all time, a game that also has an awesome twist at the end, the actual moment at the end of the original Bioshock is about as good as it gets, with Infinite also having something that's really awesome. You see, at the beginning of the game, you find yourself high in the sky in an airplane, but only moments after taking in what's happening around you, the plane has a catastrophic failure and starts hurtling towards the sea right below you. Miraculously, you survive the crash and swim to the surface, finding the wreckage and death all around you. But also, just off into the distance is a strange lighthouse sitting in the middle of the ocean. And after you approach it, you find a massive elevator that takes you to the bottom of the ocean, where you find Rapture, an entire city dedicated to building a better life away from civilization based on science and ingenuity. And it's from here on out you get to partake in an adventure discovering what exactly happened to this city, and all the secrets behind its creation and creator. Near the start of the journey, a man named Atlas comes into contact with you and tries to help you on your way, oftentimes calling out to you with the catchphrase, would you kindly, when he sees a door to go through, a power up to grab, or a switch that needs to be hit. It seems like early on that Atlas is trying to help you understand this mysterious place, but it's only when he finally instructs you to go into Andrew Ryan's office that the unbelievable truth is revealed. Throughout your time in the underwater utopia, you learn about many civil wars and uprisings that happened, one of which was led by Andrew Ryan. But when you get to his office and you are told to kill him, Atlas suddenly reveals to you that he is actually one of Andrew's rivals, and that he has been mind controlling you the entire time. Every single thing you have done in the game, every place you went, every action you took and moment you had was preceded by the simple phrase, would you kindly? And in this massive reveal, Atlas asks if you would kindly murder Andrew Ryan, your own father who you had forgotten about after your mind was wiped before you arrived at Rapture. And in this massive reveal, Atlas asks if you would kindly murder Andrew Ryan, your own father who you had forgotten about after your mind was wiped. 
It's one of the most memorable moments in a game, not just because of the family connections or the twist, but because it makes you think back on absolutely everything you have done in the game and ask yourself, do I even have any free will? It's a perfect example of what makes games as a medium so special. The idea that a question directed at a fictional character can also make perfect sense directed to us as the player, and it really makes you sit back and think, realizing that everything you experience may not actually have been of your own volition, but rather that of a mad scientist hell-bent on maintaining control over a now-fallen great city shrouded in secrecy. And it makes you think about the fact that everything we're doing in most of the games we're playing is directed by someone else, the game designers, and it makes you start to wonder, how much free will do we actually have when we're playing games? A lot of games have cool moments or interesting twists, but not a lot of them have you thinking so much about your own life long after the credits have rolled. And that's why for me, Bioshock has one of the most memorable moments in a game ever. There are very few game series out there that have a legacy quite as legendary and far-reaching as Halo. It's a series that has seen many high highs and many low lows, but no matter which game in the long-running franchise you are playing, there are some truly breathtaking moments. Like finding the Flood in the original game, Chief proclaiming he won't miss in the second, or stepping out onto the ring in Infinite. And on top of this, the games have some of the best multiplayer we have seen in the FPS genre, where the real best moments come from those late nights playing with friends after work or school. But for me, the actual best moments by far come from the third game, where it feels like every mission has a set piece or cutscene that is hard to forget. However, there is one that stands above them all, that takes place right towards the end of the game. Trying to escape from a flood outbreak, Chief and the Arbiter have no choice but to beeline for a warthog stuck in the snow. And once you hop inside, you start the most adrenaline pumping and exciting sequence in the entire series. Music starts to pick up and blare through the stereo as you must drive as fast as you can across an exploding facility where quite literally the ground beneath you is caving in every second. Enemies are running around for their lives and shooting, entire buildings are collapsing, and you are driving your warthog through obstacles and massive jumps all at the last second to narrowly make it back to your escape vehicle. And really what makes this entire scene so great is it just exemplifies everything that makes Halo fun. The bombastic and crazy set pieces with shooting, explosions, and aliens everywhere where you get to play as the greatest action hero alive to save the day. I remember when I was a kid and played this mission for the first time, I was so excited about this ending and how it made me feel. It was the culmination of a lot of buildup earlier in the game where the stakes were already so high, and with the roaring music and explosions going off everywhere, it really did feel like you were the main character in a big budget action movie. For the time too, scenes like this were so much more rare. Where now we see amazing set pieces in so many different games across different genres, Halo was one of the pioneers of moments in games like this that could actually rival movies at the time. And while there are a lot of other great moments in the Halo series, many also in Halo 3 specifically, there really was just something about this driving moment moment that just resonated with me. I knew I would have to put Halo on my list of games with the best moments, and when I thought back to my times with the games, this is the very first thing that came to my head, and I think that's for good reason. But regardless, really all of the Halo games have had their times of greatness, and it's just one of those series that's like that. And while it has lost a lot of support recently, it's a series that should never be forgotten. Death Stranding is a game that isn't for everybody. It's slow, methodical, and honestly, it's kind of boring. That's not the recipe for a blockbuster hit, but that's because it isn't trying to be. Because Death Stranding is a game that revels in the moments. Those slower and smaller pockets of time that try to evoke a feeling in all of us. There are countless times in the game where you'll be doing nothing but walking painstakingly slow between one location to another, but it's the scenery and the music that pops up into the background that carries you through the journey. Sure there is combat and faster paced vehicles and action sequences here and there, but the core of the game is about experiencing something deeper than that. About taking in the beautiful sights and sounds of a world that has fallen but is trying to rebuild. About discovering a strange alien force that makes no sense, along with the cast of characters 
that may as well be aliens too. It's a strange world that is hard to formulate and understand, but that makes it all that much better when you get moments like this. For me, the best memory in Death Stranding was the first time I made my way to Port Knot City. After traveling across so much of the environment and going through so many horrific moments, you fight or sneak your way past a section of ferocious aliens and then are met with a massive chasm leading into one of the major locations of the game a port with a boat that can help get you across the United States. And as you turn the bend and find this beautiful reveal, the music starts to swell into the scene. No more fighting, no more struggle, no more pain. Just listening to a slow and somber song full of beauty and mystery as you walk between mossy rocks and lush grass down this massive mountain. This right here is what Death Stranding is all about. And for me, it's the moment I went from thinking the game was sort of interesting to falling utterly in love. It somehow managed to make a walking simulator a riveting adventure, and having scenes like this that bury themselves into your psyche shows just how strong a powerful track and beautiful scene can be when placed at the perfect moment. It's an analogy to the beauty in our real life too, because sometimes the best adventures are just looking out into the world and taking it all in. Realizing that even in the worst cataclysms imaginable, there would still be an enchanting stillness to it all. It's a moment that can inspire sadness, hope, or melancholy alike, but no matter what this moment in Death Stranding makes you feel, it's the type of thing that will last with you for a lifetime and make you contemplate the importance of life itself. Or maybe you'll just find it pointless and fleeting. Because that's the power of moments, isn't it? One person finding so much meaning in a place where others don't find anything at all. In a way, Death Stranding is a perfect example of why I think moments are the most important part of any game. Because it's in them that we can find the real art beneath it all. The art that for some will move mountains and others drift like a feather in the wind. And for me, Death Stranding is without a doubt the former. Putting Fortnite on a list of games best moments might surprise a lot of people at first. It doesn't have those strong emotional beats of a cyberpunk or Red Dead, it doesn't have the twists and turns of a Bioshock or Inscription, and if anything, it's just a game made primarily for kids that is fun, yet shallow. However, I'd argue that Fortnite actually had one of the most significant moments in games history. And that's because in many ways, Fortnite was the catalyst for a change in how we view games, how we play them, and even how we interact with them. Back in March, 14th, of 2018, Ninja and Drake played their first round of Fortnite together, and the reason that moment was so special was because it marked a period in time where for the first time, games had gone completely and unequivocally mainstream. By this point, gaming was already massive and far-reaching, but something about that initial blow-up of Fortnite and where it went was just different. I remember when the Battle Royale was first exploding into popularity and literally every single friend I knew was playing it. My parents and family who didn't play games would talk about it and it seemed like the entire world stopped just to see what this new game was all about. Oftentimes we see games that become very popular and sell very well, but it's seldom a game has a moment quite as special as Fortnite did. And the game quite literally pushed gaming into the next evolution and has since had some of the biggest events of all time, including movie premieres and game, live music shows with famous artists like Marshmello, and really just pushing the boundaries of what everyone thought was possible in a video game. Regardless of how you feel about the game and whether or not you personally like it, without a shadow of a doubt in the entire gaming landscape as a whole, Fortnite is one of the most important games that has ever existed. And while it's primarily now played by a younger audience, at one point it captured the hearts and souls of everyone. Fortnite has a special place in my heart too because it's the game that originally got me into streaming on Twitch, which I did for years before finally to starting to dedicate my free time after work to YouTube instead. After which, in only a year of doing so, we've been able to hit over 60,000 subscribers, which by the way, thank you guys so much. And I'll never forget those late nights with friends playing Fortnite for the first time. The laughs we had, the intense final battles against the last team to get a battle royale, and the constant updates and massive community that just made the game so fun to play at the time. It's really rare you get a play something and know at the time that you're in one of the best moments you'll ever have. But even in the early days, I knew that Fortnite was something special, and that it likely would change what gaming meant for everyone forever. And while all of those changes might not be for the better, they certainly are memorable. And that's why Fortnite in its early days are, at least in my eyes, an extraordinary moment in the medium I love so much. 
Call of Duty was an instrumental game in my childhood. I would play tons of Modern Warfare 2 with friends after school and countless hours of zombies in the original installments late into the night. But for the most part, what I always found the most fun about every Call of Duty was the campaign. Multiplayer wise, I was already playing other games like Dota and Counter-Strike on PC along with Halo on Xbox. What I love so much about the COD campaigns then though, and even to this day, is that they more than most other games feel like a Hollywood action movie. I'll never forget storming the beaches of Normandy in Call of Duty 2 and feeling like I was really in a war zone or the political intrigue of Black Ops 1 and how much I love the story. But the moment that's most memorable in the entire series for me comes from the game that kickstarted the series into the stratosphere, and that's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. It was the first game in the series that took us to a more modern military playground, and the setting was instantly a winner, as it allowed for more contemporary themes and things to be explored. This meant countless unforgettable missions like All Gillied Up, where you gotta sneak through an abandoned facility and try to hit a sniper shot from miles away. But the one defining moment of this entire campaign was when the unthinkable happened a nuclear bomb being set off in a popular city as you were trying to escape via helicopter only to be enveloped by the red hot cloud of death. I still vividly remember playing this scene for the first time as a kid and being in awe at how crazy what was happening was. Seeing the real destruction humanity's most fearsome and recognizable weapon could cause. The story had been building up to this for some time too, but to actually see it happen on screen was something else entirely, and I think it also was the catalyst for COD to take more narrative risks in the future with now famous missions like No Russian in the sequel. For as much as people like to be negative about how mainstream and empty COD can feel, don't forget that in a way, it's also the series that was willing to take more risk than anyone, causing controversy Universities that reached the mainstream news even when they were on top and could risk the biggest franchise in the world. And that nuke moment is the embodiment of everything that makes COD campaigns fun, where the stakes are so high and every mission is taking you to a new location with a cast of characters you've grown to love. More than anything too, this scene was what solidified everything else in the game as some of the best COD of all time. And that's not even including the stellar multiplayer that redefined the series as well, that includes features that to this day are still still a prominent part of the online experience. I still will never forget the effect it had on me and the entire industry, and it all started in this one moment in a game so many years ago. Zelda is one of those series that just manages to capture magic after magic each and every generation. Those whimsical environments, engaging puzzle solving, and worlds focused on fun that all culminate in now one of the most recognizable IPs in not just gaming, but the world. And maybe most surprising of all, some of, if not the best Zelda games of all time are actually the newest, that being Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Both games redefined what an open world could and should be, and introduced countless new mechanics and ways to play that go beyond just being another good game in the series, but rather generation defining experiences that can't be found anywhere else, and also things that will inspire tons of games into the future. I'll be honest though, Zelda and Nintendo games in general just aren't really my cup of tea most of the time. It's the reason I don't talk about them a lot on this channel. Don't get me wrong though, I have had many fun nights playing things like Smash back in college, but I tend to gravitate to more grounded and dark worlds or ones that are more focused on philosophy and great writing. However, that doesn't mean there isn't a lot to love about Zelda. And regarding the newest entry, Tears of the Kingdom, it may actually just have one of the best moments in games out there. You see, in Zelda, the allure of the world is just going out there and exploring and solving puzzles. And some of the biggest in the game actually usually lead to grand rewards, most notably the Master Sword, the greatest weapon in all of Hyrule in most of the games. In Tears of the Kingdom, you can technically find this sword at any time, but the way most players go about finding it is stumbling upon a potentially challenging fight in the Korok Forest and Lost Woods. After defeating this boss, you can unlock a memory in-game called the Master Sword's Power, and this memory places a marker on your map leading directly to this ancient and all-powerful weapon. Strangely though, when checking this on your map, it becomes apparent that the weapon is moving around, 
and quite quickly. When you finally make your way out of the forest and look up into the sky though, you see why. The sword is being housed by a great dragon soaring through the air, and the only way to get to him is usually by building some sort of contraption to fly yourself over. And when you do so, you must scale and surmount this beast's massive body until you make your way all the way to its head, while in midair, where you can find the master sword buried in its skull. And it's in this moment that you can grasp the sword and hang on for dear life as the dragon bucks and twirls through the air. And if you are somehow able to hold on long enough, you are thrust into the sky into a sea of yellow and awe-inspiring light. The master sword, the greatest weapon in the lands, recedes from its hold and presents itself to you. The music in the scene swells and then comes to a standstill of pure silence as you take the sword and claim it as your own. It's one of those moments in Zelda that reminds you why this series is so powerful, and especially why the newest entries are so beloved. After spending potentially hundreds of hours in a world full of mysteries on land, sky, and even deep underground, you finally through your own exploration and discovery get to conquer something for yourself. And that sense of beauty, ingenuity, and wonder that this moment provides is really unlike anything else out there. It's what makes the Zelda game so memorable in the first place, and why the exploration on offer here is just one of a kind. And even as someone that's never been able to get fully behind Nintendo and what they stand for in their games, I won't deny that there really are some special moments here in Tears of the Kingdom. There have been a lot of Star Wars games in the past two decades. From massive MMOs and Starship Fighters, to squad-based tactical first-person shooters and third-person action games. For me though, the most riveting of all of these are the RPGs, and amongst these, Knights of the Old Republic sits atop the throne. It came out during the heydays of Bioware, one of the most storied game developers of all time, and told the story of a supposed Jedi making their way up their ranks, traveling from planet to planet, and either choosing to follow the tenets of the dark or the light side, forging their own path that would have drastic consequences on the story, as with any great RPG at the time. The real defining part of the original Knights of the Old Republic, though, was a massive twist right at the end, one that has now lived on in memories even decades later, and is a moment that at the time showed just how awesome video games could be. You see, in KOTOR you play as a blank slate character, who is taken in by some Jedi to train and become a master after you mysteriously wake up on a Republic ship that was boarded and attacked by a Sith Lord, only to escape onto a nearby hostile planet. Your character is able to pass the training with flying colors and extraordinarily quickly, and along the way meets with many companions that can join them on their adventure. Eventually you discover a star map that warns of a massive star forge device that is being captured by evil military forces under the command of Darth Malak to be used for no good, and so you set off on a galaxy spanning adventure to stop them. Towards the end though, you and your party are captured by the evil lord himself, and once in confinement you are brought before him to speak. It's here that the now infamous moment takes place, where Malak reveals to you that you are actually none other than one of the most storied and evil Sith Lords to have ever existed, Darth Revan. Malak had abandoned you before and you were left for dead, after which the Jedi Council was able to find you and wipe your memory, so that you could ideally come back and use your powers on the side of the light rather than the dark, now with amnesia. It perfectly explains why you were able to go through Jedi training so quickly and why you have such a strong attunement to the Force even from the beginning of the game, and also makes it so that all of those decisions you made previously to move towards the light or dark side also make perfect thematic sense. It's a twist that in retrospect you can see coming and explains away everything you have experienced up to that point, but actually seeing it for the first time while playing yourself is such an amazing moment to learn that the very thing you have been fighting against the whole game was yourself, the purest form of darkness that you could imagine. Other games afterwards have tried to have similar story beats or capture the same magic, but nothing really hits quite like the original KOTOR did. And for those of you who haven't played, the reason so many people are excited for things like the remakes that may or may not actually happen is that they could hopefully breathe life into what at the time was one of the best gaming moments out there. I've never agreed with people who judge games based on their length. Getting your money's worth isn't about spending endless hours in a world devoid of meaning and fun or wasting your life away just to justify spending some money. To me, a game's price should be qualified by how great an experience it provides, judging based on time rather than money. And sometimes, the best experiences are short and sweet, 
And well, Titanfall 2's campaign is a perfect example of this. It's one that not only takes a couple of hours to beat, but without exaggeration might just be the best FPS campaign I have ever played. And that's because the Titanfall 2 campaign is solely focused on the moments, and cuts out all of the fat. There are giant set pieces where you have to climb the inside walls of a testing facility into the sky as it all moves around you, a mission where you can on the fly travel back and forth between a different time in the past where you can change the level and enemies in front of you at a moment's notice, resulting in some of the coolest puzzle solving in an FPS game in a while, and most memorable, one of the final missions of the game called The Ark. In The Ark, you and your Titan mech warrior must travel in mid-air between high-speed ships all in a massive battle to try and get to the front, and it's even more awesome than it sounds. It's the culmination of everything that makes Titanfall 2 great, and in this mission you play as your Titan throws you across massive spaces in the sky and you land onto enemy ships and must at breakneck speeds take down every enemy as the ships are flying and dogfighting in mid-air. It's fast, thrilling, and a spectacle all to its own, and ends in you fighting alongside your mech atop a massive massive freighter moving through the sky in scenes that almost remind me of an epic ending to a samurai movie. There is no downtime, there are no side quests, just you and this one goal fighting from ship to ship, all with bombastic music and explosions in the background. And alongside this too, the ending of the mission provides one of the most emotional and moving points of the whole game. Where you and the titan that has been protecting you the whole game get into an inescapable situation where someone has to make the ultimate sacrifice. It really just is the quintessential mission full of fast paced action and somber sections alike, that all culminate in a scenario that takes takes around 20 minutes, but feels like two, the biggest compliment I could possibly give to a game. While a lot of the other best moments really rely on the emotional aspect, here in Titanfall it all comes down to the purest thing video games can provide, a huge sense of fun. And in a game that has so many amazing moments like this, standing atop all of them is a huge accomplishment. I can't stress enough how exciting this moment and really the entirety of the campaign of Titanfall 2 is. And if you haven't already given it a shot, you need to play through this story one evening and just see what happens when a game developer tries to make every second of their story count, rather than padding countless hours on top of it with side quests and useless content. Telltale Studios have made some of the most unique and emotionally moving games out there, and it's sad because this innovative workplace had to close down in 2018 after only 14 years in the business. But in those few years, they managed to make some of the most memorable games and moments out there. However, maybe the most impactful of them all is from the very first season of The Walking Dead game, which is what originally propelled them into the mainstream. Throughout the game, you play as Lee Everett, a convicted criminal who has now found himself in a world littered in the undead, and must fight and struggle his way from location to location in order to survive, meeting all sorts of characters along the way. The most important of them, though, is a young and orphaned girl named Clementine. She is sweet, innocent, and more than anything, scared of this new world around her. And with no family by her side, Lee takes her in as a sort of father figure, who is now on a redemption track to right the wrongs of his dark past. On your journey, you get to stumble upon many scenes of horror and beauty alike, where we get to analyze the deepest parts of humanity and what can happen to us when our backs are against the wall. The moment that really solidifies this game as one of the greats, though, is right at the end. For hours, the dynamic duo had managed to evade catastrophe time after time and stick together until the bitter end. But right at the finale, Lee finally gets bit by one of the undead horde, which means in only a short amount of time he will turn and become what Clementine fears most. After using his newfound powers to help move her through the horde, Clementine and Lee finally find a safe place to hold up and Lee looks at Clementine with tears in his eyes and tells her that she must make the ultimate sacrifice. He hands her his gun and and asks that she use it to stop him before he turns into an undead monstrosity, as he chains himself to a nearby heater. And with tears running down her face, Clementine pleads and prods, asking Lee why it has to be this way, and why there is so much struggle. So you watch as one of the sweetest and kindest souls has to kill the one person who has protected her from this evil world, or leave him to suffer in agony as he turns into the very thing that he protected her from for the entire game. It's one of the most emotional emotional scenes in a game out there, and is the perfect ending to the arc for both characters. Clementine finally has to fully grow up and accept the harsh realities of the world around her to become her own woman, and Lee without a shadow of a doubt redeems himself for the man he once was in a past life. It's the kind of ending that makes you sit back and think, and relish in the journey that you've just gone
spawn on, and the horrific world of The Walking Dead that it took place in. A moment that can last with you for a lifetime. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. The channel has grown from 1,000 to over now 60,000 subscribers in just one year, and the support recently has been greater than ever. Let me know down below in the comments too what moments you guys think are the best in gaming of all time. There are so many others I could have included on this list, but I had to cut myself off at some point. And on any list like this, you can't ever get everything. As well as the fact that different things speak to different people, so every list is going to be so unique. Also, if you do want to support what I do here more and help me grow the channel beyond where I've gotten to so far, feel free to check out the membership program and GOG affiliate links in the description down below, or just hit the like button and share this with people you think would enjoy it too. Thank you all so much for supporting what I do. It does mean the world to me. And as always, until next time.